Hello and welcome to Let's Talk About It. This is Taylor, your host, and today's episode, I, I'm thrilled and I'm also really, really nervous. Um, I am usually not nervous to interview people, but today's episode, I was so excited and so nervous to interview our guest. So today's topic is going to be around the racial origins of fat phobia based on um, Dr. Sabrina String's book, Fearing the Black body. So I'll give you all a short little intro here to who uh, Dr. Strings is, and then we will get straight into this interview because there's a lot to unpack here. And before we get into it, I do want to highly, highly encourage you to pick up her book at your local bookstore, order it for delivery. Highly, highly recommend getting this book. You will hear me praise it throughout. It's just, it was amazing. So a little bit about the author. Dr. Sabrina Strings is um, an associate professor of sociology at the University of California, Irvine. She's been featured in dozens of venues, BBC News, NPR, HuffPost, uh, Bitch Media, Goop. Uh, she's contributed op-eds for New York Times and Scientific American. She's a certified yoga instructor and her work on yoga Yoga has been featured in The Feminist Wire, Yoga International, and LA Yoga. Her book, Fearing the Black Body, The Racial Origins of Fat Phobia, has been named an NYU Press bestseller. It was awarded the 2020 Best Publication Prize by the Body and Embodiment Section of the American Sociological Association. And you can keep up with all of Sabrina's latest stuff on her website, sabrinastrings.com. And you can also follow her on, on Twitter at S.A. Strings. Highly recommend it. I am like fangirling over the fact that I even got to have her on this podcast, (laughs) y'all. One of my favorite episodes and favorite guests I've ever had. We're going to talk about fearing the black body talking about, you know, uh, the history of uh, fat phobia and its racial origins. So let's talk about it. All right. Welcome, Sabrina, to the show. Thank you so much for being here. This is hands down already going to be like my favorite episode I ever record. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you today. <laughs> yes. I. So I was telling you kind of before we recorded, I've never done so much homework before recording with a guest before, and I've never read a book so fast in my life. Uh, <laughs> I have... Almost, I'm literally like halfway through the last chapter um, of your book, Fearing the Black Body, the Racial Origins of Fat Phobia. And um, before we get into like what you talk about in the book and just kind of how um, fat phobia has origins in racism, um, I want to kind of preface this with a listener question that I received because I think this is pretty crucial to most of the people that will be listening to this episode. Um, So someone had asked, uh, as a white woman who is thin, is this a book I should be reading? And... Mm. (laughs) Yes. And that is a fair question. And I do get it. I do get it sometimes. It's an important one to address. I think that, yes, you should read this book. Um, And so the idea is that people should recognize no matter what your body size, we are all impacted by fat phobia. Mm -hmm. Because even if you are, let's say, a thin white woman, such as your listener, imagine the types of vitriol and the types of head shaking and finger wagging you would get if you were to gain only 10 pounds. This is how we know that although fat phobia impacts people who are identified as fat first and worst, none of us are free to allow our bodies to just evolve and change as bodies naturally do, especially as we age. So yes, it's, I think it's urgent for all of us to think about the ways in which we are disciplined such that we have to appear a certain way in public, especially women. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm curious, actually, I was kind of thinking about this throughout the book. Um, you know, as I've talked more and more about fat phobia, I've gotten a lot of like mixed feelings and um, responses about me being a thin person. Talking about even just using the word fat in general um, has been something that I've needed to provide like a content warning on because that feels very triggering for mostly thin or uh, 
white women who have struggled with their, with their weight. Um, hearing from a thin person, from a thin woman, use the word fat is triggering. And I think that's where other people, other women who are thin um, have a discomfort or a hesitation of, should I even be reading this? Should I even be like getting into this? Mm-hmm. Because that's not like my thing. Yeah, let's just get straight into the heart of it, right? Because in reality, I am also a thin person Mm -hmm. and I've been recognized as a straight sized ally, which is a badge that I wear with pride. When I started doing this research, I was interested in thin studies. Um, I think it's easy for people to forget, or maybe some people may have never known that in the 1980s and 90s, there was a whole industry of largely white feminists talking about the problems of the way in which we are required to maintain slender physiques in the Western world. And of course, white feminists, when they were writing, were saying we as all women. Mm -hmm. But part of what I'm uncovering is that originally this was about white femininity. This was about presenting a physique that was determined to be superior such that it was a justification for the racial hierarchy that we live under. Um, Mm -hmm. So, yes, I understand the discomfort um, because I am often asked, why are you doing this work? You know, and I tell them I began on this one journey. But then as I was doing the research, I realized that there was this connection between fat phobia and anti-blackness that needs to be spoken about. And I don't get to just turn away from my findings simply because I don't inhabit a fat body. Mm -hmm. I I think the other question was, should thin people use the word fat? And my understanding and speaking with people who are fat and speaking with fat activists is that fat is not necessarily a derogatory term. Yeah. Everything is context specific. So (laughs) we can say the word fat and mean it simply as a descriptor and not as a, a way of degrading folks. Mm -hmm. And that is very much the way in which I use the word fat. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think even, I mean, in some of my own personal like experiences with using this word, I've really tried to look deeper into that and almost in a way kind of explain for folks who are triggered of like, I use the word fat because it's not a bad word because I'm using it in this context. Um, And I certainly like my space is not a space for fat phobia. And I try to work actively to like fight against that because it has impacted all of us as a culture, as a society. And Mm -hmm reading this book because oh, like you got me <laughs> fucked up on some levels I'm learning all about like and I'm not I mean I will be very honest here I I, I know I should really care about history and I should be very educated on our histories and I'm um, frankly not and it has always felt very hard to uh, maintain interest and be engaged in it because it just seems like all kinds of fuckery. That's just all these white men who've just decided all this shit and, or like done all this harm and like murdered all these people. Um, and reading this, it, it made, first of all, I felt so smart. You made me feel so smart. Um, (laughs) No, that's what I want people to feel, you know? (laughs) Oh, that's that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, I, I felt so smart and also felt like a lot of the things that I had been talking about and these things that kind of made sense to me, like pre-reading the book in my head, I was like, yeah, well, fat phobia has roots in racism because people, when they imagine someone who is fat unconsciously, maybe they are imagining this image of this woman who is Thick, who was so obese and who was looked down upon, who is more likely than not, not a white woman. Mm-hmm. Um, and that through that, we then are, you know, kind of acting in a way that is through this lens of not only fat phobia, but of like racism um, that people are kind of upholding throughout this avoidance throughout this fear of becoming fat that I think people don't maybe aren't aware of. And so part of um, what your research was showing and kind of how you walked us through in the book of how fat phobia has roots in in racism was through religion and through the transatlantic slave trade. Um, Can you talk a little bit about um, maybe starting off with the slave trade, uh, which was kind of first restarted? And I was like, so... I was just like, wow, I didn't even realize that this shit, this was 16th, 1600s. Yes. 
Yes. I, that, I ain't oh. read a single book about 1600s in my life. <laughs> until not now. And I was like, oh, I'm reading about the 1600s over here and the Renaissance. And this is what they thought. And like, it was so strange to, to read. And I'm, I'm curious for you what it was like to do this research of these white men back in the day, you know, literally tallying up what proportions white women should be in order to be like this Venus of beauty. Yeah, you know, we're all familiar with various forms of beauty pageants that exist today. And we can recognize like that they're measuring on a variety of different um, things. But little do we understand that when beauty pageants were first initiated, it was very much a racialized project. It was very much about, okay, what is the skin color? Okay, I mean, what is the body size and what's the shape here and there and the, you know, the facial features? Ooh, and the idea was that they should be adhering to what are considered very European idealized forms of beauty. Mm-hmm. And of course, when we are, you know, going forward to the contemporary time, it's easy to forget that. And I understand so much of what you're saying about how I don't want to be reading these history books. We've all picked up a history book and started reading and been like, this is facts and dates. And I'm so this in the garbage. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> I didn't want to write a book like that. I wanted to tell stories about the people who were important to making this transition Mm -hmm. um, because I think it's valuable for all of us to know. And I feel like the other thing that I wanted to to point out is that so often we don't want to read black histories because we know they're going to be painful. And there were certainly times when I was writing this book and I was just like, oh my gosh, I have to look at this data. I have to write about it. Mm -hmm. But then we have to ask ourselves, but if it's painful to look at it, how much more of a problem is it if we avoid it? Yeah. If we avoid this history, this knowledge, we are destined to repeat it. And that's mm-hmm. effectively what we've been doing since at least the 18th century, right? We've been maintaining yeah. this fat phobia as a form of anti-blackness for hundreds of years because it has been un- um, unknown up mm-hmm. until the present. Yeah. And if we're reading it and being like, oh, this history is painful, also imagine the impact that those painful events, that 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 those painful findings have had over so many years. Like it's mind blowing here. Um, part of how kind of you started this book out was through history, right? Looking at like 16th century, 17th century. And I, I remember because I was thinking, I was like, yeah, at one point it was a desirable trait for a woman to be voluptuous, to not be super thin. Um, and that there was almost this like fetish for that um, within, oh, I'm going to try to sound smart, but I'm no historian. You're doing it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, um, within, within Europe. Um, and then it seemed like through the slave trade, these white men were now being exposed to African women and in some ways had kind of like you spoke on earlier, picked apart pieces of um, their facial features that were in alignment with European standards. So they were still of beauty um, and held this voluptuous figure that at the time was attractive and fetishized for women. And then slowly along the way, maybe not so slowly, I don't know, but it switched to being this gluttonous, sleepiness, laziness, all these terrible things. Can you, can you touch on this for a sec? Yes, absolutely. So when I first started doing this work, I was like, oh, you know what's fascinating? We had Marilyn Monroe in the 1950s and she was all the rage and she was a size 16, you know, especially toward the end of her career when she had mm-hmm. starting, started becoming even more voluptuous than when she began. And so I was like, what happened between Marilyn Monroe and Twiggy, you know, it was like mm-hmm. that five years was, you know, crazy, something really wild mm-hmm. in that five years. And then I was like, as I started doing this research, I noticed that as early as the 19th century, uh, already women's magazines in the United States were talking about fat in these very racialized ways. They were like, oh, you know what? We are Anglo-Saxons and Anglo-Saxons are taller and slenderer than women throughout the world. And, you know, and this is the basis of our beauty. And I was like, whoa, whoa. Like, this is the 19th century. This is well before Marilyn yeah. Monroe. Like, how is it that this has been going on for this long? And so, okay, this was what I was doing largely in the dissertation. When I decided to write the book, I thought, rather than just telling this story, 
this American story. Because as it turns out, America was very important to the transition to the slender aesthetic. Oh, yeah. Yes. So I said, why don't I go back in history to the Renaissance, to the time in which we know in the Western world that voluptuous physiques were prized and be able to explain the transition from the voluptuous ideal Mm -hmm. that we see in the paintings of people like Raphael and Peter Paul Rubens and Titian, you know, these Mm -hmm. very thick women. We move from that to extremely slender women. So what Mm -hmm. took place? And so in my research, what I found was just what you said was that in the beginning, Black women were this exciting novelty to mm-hmm. artists, to philosophers, to the colonists even. They were like, oh, wow, look at these Black women. And don't they have these nice figures with their rounded shoulders, you know, and their mm-hmm. nice you know, legs? And I mean, they were about it in the beginning, you know. Yeah. Then as slavery proceeded, right, because at the beginning, the point that I was articulating, we're talking largely about the 16th century. Mm-hmm. But by the 17th century, now slavery is a booming enterprise and black people still a novelty in some places, but not unheard of. Mm-hmm. Now there's less of a sense that look at this curiosity. Look at these women. You know, we've never seen women like this to hmm, slavery is an important enterprise and it's lucrative. And we used to identify our slaves based largely on skin color. But between all of the sex that's taking place in the colonies, Skin color is no longer a good proxy for civility versus barbarity. So we need other things. So now in the 18th century, 17th century rather, there was this move to say, okay, but race is more than just skin color. Mm -hmm. Um, And as the decades continued so that we are now entering the 18th century, there was a greater articulation of the fact that we think black people are over sensuous. They love sex. They love food. And because of that, they're prone to venereal diseases and they're prone to be fat. Mm -hmm. We as Europeans, we have a better standard for ourselves. We know about self-control. And so we're going to pick a model of beauty that shows that we have the ability to control ourselves. And that model of beauty for our women will be slenderness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was the start of, I'm going to say this word wrong, um, aesthetic Aesthetic? Yes, the, uh, yes, right. Aesthetic, aesthetic, right. Aesthetic, aesthetic. <laughs> the aesthetic, aesthetic. <laughs> I was learning words. That's I get to, I was Googling shit. I was like, what's this one mean? <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, that was kind of the start of that. And through that um, kind of enchantment with the black body, you had told this story about this woman and Oh, reading this whole story, I was like, oh my gosh. Um, I believe her name was Sarah Bartman. Um, and she was literally put on display as um, kind of this barbaric, uh, gluttonous example of what a black woman was, that she had um, a large butt and that people would come from all over. I mean, she was sold, then she was owned, then she was like put on display for other Europeans to come and just be like, wow, look at her body. And then people would pay to be able to have sex with her. And at first, when I was first reading about her, I was like, oh my gosh, like, this is so shitty. Like, she's being objectified. Like, how were people this, like, fascinated with, like, fatness even? And then I thought to present day, Biggest Loser and TLC, My 600 Pound Life. And I was like, my mom and I used to watch My 600 Pound Life all the time. It was like one of our favorite shows. Mm. And why was that? Like, because, I mean, in my own reflection here, that there was this sort of, like, fascination of like, oh, this is very different. And I haven't seen anyone that looks like this before. So at the same time, I was like judging these people, these like white Europeans and being like, how the fuck, like, that's so fucked up that they would be treating it like this. But then also really realizing where, oh shit, this has actually really seeped into our culture. And like, I have in the past also been prone to have a similar like, oh, wow, like, okay, I'm going to like look at this and this is really different. Um, But it was really, really sad just overall kind of to read um, about her story. And and this one part really stuck out to me that um, when people would come to see her, they were almost disappointed 
that she wasn't kind of more savage that that her dress seemed very un, like very tame um and that then they had to like dress her up to kind of build up this uh, very sexualized savage um, that people had anticipated her to be. Um, Absolutely. And even some people complained that she was a svelte Venus. Like, hey, I thought I was coming to see a fat person. And by that time, fat people were already deemed monstrous. I mean, she wasn't even the only person who was deemed fat who was on display in like one of these exhibitions in Paris and London. Um, and so, you know, absolutely what they were doing and just to tell a little bit more of the backstory of, of Sarah Bartman mm-hmm. before we get into what was happening in yeah. her exhibits, she was a slave uh, in South Africa at the Cape. And so we often don't think of there being actual slaves in Africa, but this is sometimes what would take place, which was that people would be um, sort of stolen, purchased whatever the mechanism. And then sometimes they would be transferred to the colonies. Other times they would be left as slaves within um, places in Africa. So she was a slave in Africa and she was working as what was known as an infirmary delight on the Cape. She was taken to dance for the six, six soldiers who were stationed there who were European. And at a certain point, a European entrepreneur by the name of Alexander Dunlop saw her and was like, oh, you know what? I can make a killing if I could get her to Europe. So he purchased her from her handler there and brought her first to London and then to Paris to put her on display, uh, put her on display and display, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, And so what she would do is that they would dress her in this full Africanized garb. It was just nonsense. It wasn't really a representation of her culture, but it looked African to people who didn't know, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And then they would put her in an enclosure and the audiences would come in and they would wait. And at a certain moment, she would be told to come out, right? And so she'd be wearing this like loosely described as African garb. She would then sort of emerge from the shadows. And the idea was that she was supposed to be frightening and scintillating and tantalizing and terrifying all of these things at the same time she's sexualized because she's a black woman and she's on display for her figure yeah right they but would comment also, on her on their labia on black yes. women's labia they were like right. fascinated with it and then not until she died this dude asked if he could like examine and draw her labia and she was like no and then he waited till she died and then he did it exactly right george cuvier precisely Fuck him Right, right, right. But like at the same time, how common is that in terms of treatment of black women and other minoritized women? It's like our no doesn't always mean no. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Which is extremely troubling. And so absolutely, that was her life. You know, European audiences would be gawking at her. They would be terrified. And in their minds, some of them had never seen a black woman before. She was an iconic representation of black beauty and black femininity, largely because, as some of them said, she was three quarters and three yards round, right? So this was the mysticism surrounding her figure. Mm -hmm. Even as, again, there were other people who came and were like, well, she just looks like any other person that I might see, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously her skin is dark. Yep. But, you know, there were those people who bought into the terror and those who could see through it. And Mm -hmm. anyway, that all speaks to the way in which we want there to be a different category of humanity for those individuals we are attempting to denigrate. Yeah. And, and it was kind of around all of that, that, um, like race science, I think it was that that was coming up and, uh, that people literally thought I'm like peeking at my notes here and I'm like, Oh, fuck this. Fuck that. Fuck that. Um, (laughs) that, that these white, that, that the European people thought that other people were meant to be quote natural slaves because of the quote types of race And in this classification of mankind that they literally thought that they they developed like a hierarchy of race and white people were the first race. And then later on, there's like delineations within that that I'll ask you about. Um, But that that they attribute that they like tried to get scientific about this and thought that like because black people came from warmer climates, that that was linked to being more plump because they developed uh, more bile in their stomach where they had more liquid and that made their skin darker. And like, therefore they also then 
were lazy because of the sun and they had ample food around because of the climate. So they were just lazy and they would just sit around and eat. And that was like the linking of body size to race. Yes. Yes. And we can see how doctors were engaging in what we might be calling MSU, make shit up. It's like, (laughs) um, now there is no way (laughs) that we could prove that simply living in a place where it's warm makes everybody there lazier necessarily than everybody in colder climates. I mean, so they were just Mm -hmm. making shit up. And unfortunately that was rather common as a form of quote science when it pertained to race and body size. So what they were saying, even though they knew that they didn't really have any functional empirical evidence, there was somebody else smart who had already said it. And so it was like a confirmation bias and -hmm. everyone was just reproducing the same ideas. You know, evidently this leads us to eugenics in which there was a very similar policy of let's look at people, let's talk about where they're from, and then let's assume if they're sick or well based on that. Mm-hmm. So there's a long history within the field of fields of science and medicine of yeah. these non-scientific ways of dealing with black bodies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh my gosh. There's so, so, I'm like wrapping my brain around this. There's so many things here from this book and from everything that you just said. Um, we briefly had, had touched on the aesthetic aesthetic um, mm-hmm. and in that section, I was, um, very surprised to learn about Mary had a little lamb. Um, <laughs> not a fan, no more. Um, <laughs> right? And it was a good jam, but now we have reason to dislike it. Yeah, n- not n- not a fan. Um, but where up until that point, this was basically all like white men who were deciding these proportions of beauty, who were discussing kind of the, um, at least in a maybe academic or in a philosophical way, um, um, in a, in a, a way in a of way power. power that um, race being linked to body size. And then we had Mary Had a Little Lamb, um, who then was coming in and kind of uh, we saw like the combination of religion in, um, I'm going to say this word wrong probably. What was the name of the magazine? Goddies or goodies? Goddies. Oh, goodies. Goddies. Goddies. And Goaties Magazine. And then we see Cosmo come up. And I was babble. Mm-hmm. I turned to Zach, my boyfriend. I said, Cosmo was around in the 17 what? The 18 what? <laughs> right. Cosmo was around that long? And the New York Times, I was like, oh, my God. But just knowing that a magazine like Cosmo that was around back then, that was essentially a follow-up to the original uh, Goaties Magazine, um, lets you know how long just how freaking long these messages of what women's bodies should look like and how they cater specifically to white women and to the white race was like, holy shit, light bulb. Um, Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about kind of what was in this magazine um, and how kind of we see the definition of what like an American beauty is gets kind of created in that time of the aesthetic aesthetic right <laughs> uh so Godey's was an important magazine because in the 19th century just like now a lot of the publishing um venues were helm or had men at the helm uh, in other words so what we find was that this was a magazine in which there was a woman who was an editor and she was very much invested in a lot of the more christian movements that were going on at the time these reform movements which were saying okay um in the middle of all of this immigration at this time from ireland um because of the fact that even though today we view irish people as white historically they were not necessarily deemed the mm-hmm. same level of at a level of white as anglo-saxons yeah. and so there was a lot of fear surrounding the integration of the mm-hmm. anglo-saxons and the irish race and i learned all because i didn't really know that about like celtic irish and like the um the kind of disagreements within the class of race within whiteness Um, Mm -hmm. but then I kind of understood, I was like, yeah, like Irish do have this very like strong, almost like nationalism, patriotism to being Irish. And I'm like, oh, I understand that much better now because they were actually like 
kind of discriminated against um, throughout this and to be told that they are less than of this white superior race because they were thought to have been close to um, Aryans, which were closer to blackness. But then later, Aryans were actually the supreme race of whiteness. Am I getting that right? Well, I don't know if they were considered close to Aryans, but they were deemed to be, um, for whatever reason, too dark. It's like, um, you know, having light eyes, light skin, light hair, all of these are aberrations amongst the Celtic people. And this is how we know that they are not like us, because for Anglo-Saxons, we are mostly very pale. We are mostly having light eyes, blonde hair. And so now how it is that they came to the conclusion that Irish people were part black um, you know, it's, this is again about the surreality of race. Like, what is the basis of that? They were yeah. like, well, <laughs> you know, they were just, you know, going with whatever they could find mm-hmm. that would well, serve they saw that they better. were, that they were like gluttonous with their drinking and that they mm. were like shorter. And so that was like, they're, they're closer to blackness because our definition and our understanding of blackness is that they are larger and they are gluttonous and they are lazy. Right, right. So they start looking for anything, effectively, that they believe that can link them. And they're like, well, here's some things. You know, we think that they are more robust, you know, that's Mm -hmm. how they would say it, more corpulent. Um, We think that their skin is darker. Um, You know, the fact that they were also poor didn't help, right? So we think often about the relationship between race and class. So here we have Irish people coming to the United States, having very little money, often women. This is another thing that people don't point out. We are talking about single women. And there was this real terror that they're going to come and try to take the Anglo-Saxon men. Ooh. <laughs> and so what Anglo-Saxon women were doing in these magazines, that they were creating these very clear racialized distinctions. We're like, okay, well, you know, black women, but you know, that was to a lesser extent. They were really concerned about these Irish women. These Irish women, they are fat. They are poor and they are in our homes. They are our domestic workers. And we need people to know that we are not cool with their aesthetic representations. We are not into those kinds of things. As Protestants and as Anglo-Saxons, these are the ways in which we behave that are proper to our race and our religion. And that included what they call temperance at the table. You don't overeat. If you want to overeat, then you can, they would say you can black up and you can go to Africa. But in America, as a white woman, you maintain a limited diet. Yo, I'm ready to fight someone. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) It's mind-blowing. They would say the quiet parts out loud all the time. Because what? It didn't have to be quiet in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and through the, the use of these magazines, uh, the Anglo-Saxon women were kind of able to like create a community for themselves that was essentially like setting the, um, the roles. Like at one point it was even like, you know, it's the woman's responsibility to check the indulgence of the man, you know, who better to check that than, than the woman of the household. And I was like, Mm-mm, fuck that shit. Like that's right. patriarchy right there. No. <laughs> Um, but it was so like, it was so prominent throughout the, I mean, these magazines were setting the culture. They were setting these standards for beauty, for health. Um, and it, (laughs) it then is what kind of gets us towards this place of, of eugenics that you had mentioned earlier, which obviously like I'd heard of before, um, through like Hitler and everything, but was not super aware of how it also included or had a specific emphasis around fatness and being Mm -hmm. slender. And then it kind of seemed like, you know, with Kellogg, serial guy who, screw him, um, (laughs) very racist. His whole thing was to like uphold the white race and how do we help these American beauties, our Anglo-Saxon women who now are too thin and mm-hmm. appear weakish and just uh, un- unfit, that they appear ill because they are so thin. And the reason why they were so thin was because they were trying to avoid that robust figure that was associated with black women, with slaves, with people who were less than the um, Irish people as well. Mm-hmm. Oh, Lord. And it's like, we see that today. And that's where I'm like, I don't think that white women realize 
how fat phobia is related to racism and that it allows them, I mean, in most everyday life anyway, to uphold white supremacy without knowing it when they think that they just want to lose weight. But then I'll even hear things of like, well, I like to go get, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to get carried out, carried away here. Um, but eugenics wasn't super aware of how it included that like disdain for fatness. Yes. And yet again, racialized. And so when we think about the eugenicists, they were, as you were saying, they were in conversation with these women's magazines. We don't think of women's magazines as being that powerful, right, to Mm -hmm. impact medicine. But very clearly, doctors were writing and they were talking about the aesthetics that were popularized within these magazines. And I think one of the things that the book shows is that even though women can be oppressed, like all of the second wave feminists were talking about, um, you know, the, the Susan Bordos, the Naomi Wolfs, Kim Turnins, et cetera, even though women can be oppressed, women can also participate in the furtherance of their own oppression and in the oppression of other non-white women, right? And this is precisely what was happening in these magazines. They were like, Mm -hmm. oh, well, this is what white men are telling us is appropriate. Okay, well, then we'll embody that and we'll take it to its most um, excessive extreme. Like we will really outdo ourselves such that even men are like, wait, these women are getting a little too slim. Um, How do we get them to actually take up physiques that are not fat, like the quote unquote savages, but not as skinny as they've gotten? And so that was a lot of the project of these eugenicists. They were like, how do we find a more comfortable medium, right? We understand that there are certain races that are too fat and they would list these races. And a lot of them are races that we now consider white ethnic groups. Right. Mm -hmm. They would be like, oh, you know, in certain places of Ireland, certain places of Italy, you know, certain Jews. Right. Whereas, you know, there are definitely those, you know, the Germans, the English that we think have the right figures. Mm -hmm. So there were there was always this conversation between what white women had adopted as their own means of maintaining their superiority through their figures and the eugenicists who were saying they're on to something. We want to draw it back a little bit. But mostly we think that they're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you said it all right there. And even as I was reading that in my head, I think I did say it out loud, actually. I was like, "Mm mm-hmm. And why are people confused that white women are voting for Trump and upholding what their white (sighs) male partners are wanting? Well, hello. It literally started in the fucking 16th centuries, whatever, when, you know, white men are literally like defining what is beauty for women and then white women hopping on board and saying, yep, okay, this actually is like kind of harmful to our health and fucking us up a little bit. But you know what? Yeah, we're going to hold on to that. We're going to attach to that and be like, yep, you're right. So now we're going to hold that up. And while doing so, we're also going to put down all these other people, all these other women. Uh, yeah. But we we are in a safer position because we are appeasing. We are going to be protected by the white man who was deciding all of these things. Um Dear Lord, what a headache that is. We are in an economy in which all of us are expected to constantly try to climb up to the place where white men are. And white men, of course, then would have an impetus to try to keep us all away from what they have carved out as their space of privilege. And so what it means is that, of course, a lot, not all, but many white women, especially with the vote, are going to be casting their lot with white men because they're hoping to get to where they are, not understanding that that is always going to be prevented. Like that is why patriarchy exists. That is why white supremacy exists. We're not ever all going to be able to somehow try to get up to where white men are. Instead, we need to be thinking about what are our values? How do we want to align our society and organize ourselves according to that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think, so one thing I want to make sure that we do touch on here, and if it isn't already making sense for folks of how fat phobia has bases in racism. Uh, you're a thousand percent getting to pick up the book anyway. But um, with, with, I think, kind of the combination and kind of mergence of the religious sectors of these women's magazines, mm-hmm. of uh, the slave trade, of all these things kind of coming together within America, we then have this development of the BMI. And mm-hmm. I had said this, like, 
a while back uh, that the BMI is racist and that fuck the BMI. Yeah. That is not like even using the word overweight, I don't like using because, well, what what is the quote correct weight then? Yeah. What am I overweight from or what am I underweight from? Um, and I've had this discussion many times with friends and family where I'm like, no, fuck the BMI. And then it's this whole conversation of like, well, how do, are we measuring health then and people who get diabetes then? And I'm like, you don't understand all of this is based in racism and <laughs> MS, MSU, we're making sure shit up. Yep. Yep. BMI is yet another perfect example of that. And it's a critical moment, especially for people who consider themselves to be liberal or progressive and are actually concerned about health disparities, especially Mm -hmm. health outcomes within black communities, which is that BMI is not rooted in empirical science. It is exactly the type of eminence-based medicine that race science was, which is why I included in the book. Mm -hmm. Effectively, this is what happened. When the medical establishments, after for a long time looking at women's magazines and being like, "Mm, we can follow their lead, when they decided to take up questions of the relationship between weight and health, what they did was that they were relying on these insurance company tables. Um, They were called these standard weight tables. And insurance companies were like, okay, we're going to insure people who we believe are fit based on our limited analyses of the relationship between weight and mortality. Now, Insurance companies were not insuring all Americans. They were insuring a very small slice of elite white men, right? The people who could get insurance in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So by the mid 20th century, actually maybe more like the 1970s, there were growing concerns about using these insurance tables. And there was one white man in particular, his name was Ansel Keys, was like, we're going to use something else. We're going to use BMI. BMI was developed... Um, as something that was known the Ketelet Index by a Belgian statistician in the 19th century, he was like, this is not to be used for individual adiposity. And so then, of course, Ansel Keys was like, we're going to use this to measure individual adiposity. And he was like, you know what? The standard weight tables are arbitrary, but, you know, and BMI is arbitrary, but it's fine. We were, basically, he was like, we're exchanging one arbitrary measure for another. How is that science? And so ever since then, just like the way that eminence-based medicine worked within the 19th century, ever since then, people have just been reproducing the idea that we need to hang on to BMI because it's some important measure of the relationship between weight and health. That is false. In fact, what BMI is doing is it's stigmatizing people who are not within a, quote, normal weight range, and it's leading to worse health outcomes for these folks, right? Mm -hmm. And to the extent that approximately 40% um, of the entire United States is considered, you know, obese. This means that nearly half of all Americans are being stigmatized by their weight and experiencing worse outcomes than if we simply did away with it. We don't need something else in its place. We can just take a holistic approach to human beings, recognizing that they are individuals and treat the individuals that are before us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's, and, and I almost like want to incorporate this in some of my, some of my work therapeutically with white women that I work with who struggle with body shame, um, who are the, you know, searching and, and really like hurting themselves to reach this quote, normal range of a BMI of health to be like this, you were told everything you were told was bullshit. Mm-hmm. Like you mm-hmm. are okay the way that you are. Your weight, your fat is not indicative, indicative whatever, of right. your health. And something that really stuck out to me um, kind of in that section on BMI was that, um, you know, they found that black women had the highest BMI in the country and therefore their bodies were literally dis- evidence of disease. Right, right. Just like 200 years Prior. And so the other thing, I think people, when they hear me talking about BMI as eminence-based medicine, they're sort of like, well, but how is it racist? <laughs> it's like, if one white guy is setting a global standard for how all of us need to behave, we can understand that this did not in any way query the views, the experiences, the life courses of any single people of color. Like not mm-hmm. anybody within the Black community, not Latinx folks, not, and not no one, right? Yeah. So every single group of color was not consulted in the creation mm-hmm. of the standard that is now disciplining all of us. And that is what makes it racist. It's what we would call colorblind racism. 
Yeah. Well, and that's racism literally built into the systems and the structures of our entire country, of our, I mean, I'm not like world, of our world, the BMI is based on a worldly basis. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, Yeah, that I don't think folks even realize, like that is the power that people talk about within racism, that like Mm -hmm. racism is not just, oh, a microaggression of, oh my God, I love your skin color. It is literally, (laughs) oh yeah, mm -hmm. Mm. Um, it is, it's literally at like the basis of our systems that we just consider to be so normal. Um, And and to that, I would say it just, it reminds me of what President Obama said in his conversation with Mark Maron on the WTF podcast. He was like, you know what? undoing racism is about more than simply telling people not to use the n-word because racism it's actually ubiquitous especially within american society for people who want to read another book take a look at isabel wilkerson's new book cast in which she describes how you know america is a racial caste system Mm -hmm. um it's one of the premier race making nations and so we should not be surprised that we will find anti-blackness in a variety of terrains and then going back to bmi not only is it racist for being colorblind, um, but also the way in which it's being used, the way in which we are discussing Black women's bodies is that they are constitutionally diseased because of having an elevated BMI. Mm -hmm. And we can see how this does not take any other factors that may be contributing to health, wellness, or illness into consideration. Maybe a person is fat, but they love their lives. They have wonderful relationships with their families in their communities. They enjoy cooking. They enjoy, you know, dancing. They enjoy, you know, whatever it might be, scuba diving. They have wonderful, fulfilling lives. But, well, they're diseased because they're BMI. Like, how does that make any sense? Health is about more than just having your BMI within this curious category that was determined a few decades ago by this one white man. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. It just further perpetuates that, you know, what they found in their quote findings of black women being in in a higher BMI of being diseased of that people who are non-white people who are not outside or people who are outside of that quote normal range are less than like inherently is what that tells us that you are less than that you are um, th- I was so surprised at how big of a thing like gluttony was that yeah. that people really, really throughout history held on to gluttony, that this was like, oh, like we cannot be gluttonous. We need to be temperate and we need to, you know, I- and there was literally a section where this one guy, I'm forgetting his name and honestly don't even want to fucking know it. Um, <laughs> but he, I'd rather know Sarah than fucking whatever his name was. Um, but he, he was basically like, promoting that people restrict their diets and that sometimes that they will even purge, um, essentially literally creating eating disorders like in the fucking 16th century of, you know, if this is what it takes to, if this is what it takes for a white woman to be appealing and to be attractive for white men to want to continue on our superior white race, then yeah, you should throw up a little bit. Then yeah, you do need to restrict your weight and, you know, eat a milk and grain fat diet. And, you know, <laughs> I'm just like, oh, what? Right. how does nobody check this? Like, how is this able to just be what was quote right and be perpetuated throughout centuries? Like, no. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought up the question of diets, because when we're talking about black women in particular, people often want to say like, well, why don't black people just eat less ribs? You know, why are black people enjoying so many pecan pies? You know, (laughs) black people can just have their greens without ham hock. That's how they can live. Right. And it's like, you know what? You don't get to say that I should not enjoy food, that I should not Mm -hmm. enjoy my cultural preparations because somehow my culture is now being deemed pathological. When in reality, all Americans enjoy mac and cheese. I don't know any race of people that don't like burritos and ribs. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we don't get to claim that it's about our culture. And the other thing I would say about that, it's like, 
there are unhealthy diets throughout the world and plenty in the United States. And I'm not going to claim to know so much about a diet like keto, let's say. Mm -hmm. But now keto is a diet that, as far as I can tell, is being promoted by a lot of white men. And it involves the restriction of fruits. Um, Mm -hmm. How is that not being receiving greater scrutiny by the medical field, right? If we're really concerned about having people eat right, then we should be looking at the fact that there's all these white men who are like, oh, you know, I don't want those vitamins. Um, Mm -hmm. Those vitamins come with too much sugar. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Which again, actually, almost as you say that in my head, I'm like, yeah, well, that is also like a fear of sugar, which leads to fat, which in what the 16th, 17th century with the slave trade in Europe, where then sugar was was in Europe and all these coffee shops and all this stuff kind of came up. And then uh, like, I think it was like a few years later, people hadn't made the connection. Like these doctors or health people, whatever, hadn't made the connection that the sugar was responsible for like the increase in, you know, like heart problems and um, weight gain and, and all of this stuff. And that in my head, I was like, well, Obviously, if you're like dosing yourself up with a ton of sugar and a ton of caffeine, you're probably not going to feel the best. Mm -hmm. um, And that's probably not going to be treating your body in the, you know, nicest way. Um, But that, that, that even within that dynamic of history and how that impacted how like white people ate and how their bodies changed, there was like an implicit association then with like, well, we don't want to be gluttonous and fat like the black people who are our slaves here. Um, so we need to, you know, restrict our eating and do all this stuff, blah, 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 and really like take a look at our diets. Um, mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And the funny thing is, I remember I did a presentation about this maybe two years ago, and um, there was a very knowledgeable white man in the audience listening. And he said, well, didn't they see thin black people? You know, like, did it? And, you know, you're trying to explain that this is immaterial in a way. Like, sure, they might have seen thin black people, although they wouldn't have seen that many black people, right, in the era of slavery in a place like England where they Mm -hmm. were creating some of these ideas. But that didn't matter. Even as as we talked about already with Sarchi Bartman, um, people would have seen her and some would have just seen the monster that they wanted to see. And then some would have been like, hey, this is not what I was told. Uh, And so just being able to see an individual doesn't necessarily undermine racism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so much. Mm, It is. Yeah, exactly. It's it's a lot to unpack. Um, Yeah. But I think like the way that you've kind of brought it together and not even brought it together because shit is there is there uh you're just like hey we've talked about like this piece we've talked about the slave trade and then we've also talked about you know these uh the religious sectors and and how that's impacted culture but y'all haven't realized how both of those things at the same time um are not only racist but are also perpetuating fat phobia yeah yeah it's one of those difficult issues because I've heard so many doctors um, who are like, yeah, you know what? Fat stigma is bad, but we really got to get fat people to lose weight. And it's like, well, we don't get to say both of those things in the same breath. We cannot, uh, you know, admit that fat phobia is a problem, that fat stigma is a problem, but then still try to force people to look a different way. If we know fat phobia is a problem, then we can recognize that we need to do something differently. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, what is the point of continuing to tell people to lose weight? We've been telling Americans to lose weight at least since 1999 when the so-called obesity epidemic was declared. And how far has that gotten us? It, mm-hmm. Nothing has changed. Um, yeah. That people have a right to exist and we have no mm-hmm. business telling them to lose weight. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think it also, you know, looking at like the agricultural revolution as well and looking at some of these things uh, like processed foods and, you know, the food deserts and whatnot too also play a big part in that. And like the medical field that is so concerned with fat people losing weight appear way less, like have literally zero attention at all to food deserts, to actual access to, um, you know, fruits and vegetables plentiful, not to say that people who are eating fruits and vegetables are never fat um, or that the reason that people 
are fat is because they are not eating fruits and vegetables. But in general, from a health perspective, um, I would think that if someone in the medical field is so concerned with folks losing weight that they would also want them to have actual access and plentiful and education on an actual like real healthy diet and not um it's kind of upholding in our culture of fast processed food uh because that is pretty prominent here in the states i think more so than anywhere else no yes i mean and actually that is what you see it's like once the spread of fast food takes place globally then you start to see more of the illnesses that we typically associate with obesity, but in reality are a matter of the fact that people are eating processed foods, you know, sort of packaged for, to be shelf stable, um, Mm -hmm. therefore pumped with like plenty of chemicals and other things we don't need in our bodies. And so instead of regulating industries, what we do is tell people, well, industries have the right to produce whatever they want, but you shouldn't eat it. It's like, well, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, We shouldn't, it's like that Portlandia uh, episode. What should we ban? It's like, well, no, like it's not up to us to ban people from eating licorice. Like yeah. instead, we could work on simply providing access to things that people need. Mm-hmm. We don't get to tell people that they should never have McDonald's. That's not for us to do. Instead, what if we focused on putting more grocery stores in neighborhoods that don't really have any? There are neighborhoods like that where they have to go to convenience stores. Yeah. What if we focused on trying to make um, exercising options more accessible? Not everybody has $100 a month to go to the gym, right? So there's all of these ways in which we could make these things available for people and Mm -hmm. not shame them or try to prevent them from enjoying Wendy's if they'd like to go to Wendy's. Yeah, and I think again, like even as we talk through that, I imagine most people are thinking of people of color because again, when you look at gentrification and the slave trade and the lack of actual opportunity and, um, you know, support from our systems when black people get quote unquote free um, throughout history, right? Like those are the people that are coming to mind. That is literally where that like that mergence there of fatness, of being unhealthy, of being low income, of being black or a person of color, um, where all of that literally has been like fucking entwined for centuries. For centuries, yeah. And it's invisible to us. And this is the reason why we keep doing the same things over and over. I think that's why it's so important to have conversations like this, Mm -hmm. Um, especially because as you uh, opened with Many people think this is not about them. You know, they might be a white person. They might be a slender person. Maybe they're a man, you know, or a person with a non-binary gender identity. It's sort of, they're like, well, this is not really about me. No, this is about all of us. Mm -hmm. We are all within this American stew where we've inherited these biases unwittingly. And we have to find out about them, rethink the way we've been doing things, and then do things differently if we really want to approach equitable society. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, one of the questions that I got from listeners, um, there's actually three here that I want to make sure we touch on. Um, People want to know what action steps they can take, like individual and community um, on on both of those levels. Um, Someone asked if the term bubble butt is rooted in language about the black body. Um, And then kind of the impacts of both fat phobia and racism in workplace and dating, which I feel like is a whole other podcast. Oh, yeah. Oh, we need to come back (laughs) together and talk about the whole dating issue. That's a whole other hot bottle wax. Um, But yes, there are so many different things. So in terms of the origin of the term bubble butt, I don't actually know that. Um, Mm -hmm. I feel like Martin Lawrence used to say it on the show, Martin, but I don't know if he came up with that term. So yeah, I I really can't speak to that. And, you know, it's funny because I did start doing research on the origin of the term thick, because again, Mm -hmm. I know that thick is something that black people have been saying for decades. Yeah. Um, but when I tried to look into its origins, I wasn't able to find very much. And that has a lot to do with the fact that for so much of what we experience in America as black people, we simply didn't have the ability to write things down. Um, It's not until, if we're being honest, it's not until the 1960s, 70s, where the education of Black communities was even given any type of priority. Because keep in mind that prior to 50 years ago, we were still under Jim Crow. So a lot of things that took place in our communities, we simply don't know about. It's hard to find out. So 
you know, we'll have to figure out a way to get to some of these, some of these questions. But unfortunately, I don't have an answer for that right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but as it pertains to fat phobia and, you know, anti-blackness in the workplace, I think absolutely. Yeah. And there are people like Roxane Gay um, who have written about this and who have talked about this so eloquently, which is that she shows up in a space, um, for example, because she's on her way to give a talk. And she's be, being met with all of this fat phobic anti-black nonsense, right? People are like looking at her like, but does she belong here? Like, mm-hmm. does she have any money? You know, she talks about standing in a first class line because she is a famous person. And then people are being like, oh, excuse me, um, this is first class. And then she has to tell them I can read. Right. And so she's experiencing all of this fat phobia in her everyday life. Mm -hmm. That is also obviously a form of anti-blackness. Fat people don't belong in a place. Black people don't belong in a place. And so being fat and black compounds that discrimination. Mm hmm. Yeah. And I think even to the dating piece here, I mean, when we just look at even part of the history that we just talked about of like this preservation of the pure white race and of eugenics, that was not like just this thing of like fucking Hitler, that this was like in the United States, that this was like <laughs> very prominent uh, within the health, within the uh, medical field, within culture um, that there was this preference. There was a preference that literally, I think I jotted this down actually. Um, Yeah, that a white woman would be considered reckless to sleep with a Negro because all of her subsequent children would be part black and create bad blood. Right. You know, more MSU. It's like, they didn't even try to figure out how that made sense, but they just said it anyways. Um, And so, yeah, I think we all have to admit that there is a hierarchy of preferences when it comes to women and that white women are often given the top spot. That is just what white supremacy is like, that there's this relationship between feminine ideals and whiteness. And this is impacting men, you know, cisgender, heterosexual men, regardless of race. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, goodness. Um, the, the last thing here that I want to make sure that we touch on, granted, literally could go on forever on all of this. Um, you do some work related to race and yoga. Um, and I'm wondering if you can share and talk a little bit about that um, because I do think the wellness field in general, right, which kind of is dominated by white women, um, is very much coming from a place of, of fat phobia and racism. Um, I see very little inclusion there. Uh, one of my girlfriends, Les, she's been on the show twice now, I think, and she has a podcast, Balanced Black Girl, and her whole podcast is about wellness within Black women um, and wanting to hold space for uh, Black women in wellness, knowing that the wellness field is uh, predominantly white. <laughs> Commercialized. Uh, mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Absolutely. And yoga is one of those very troubling spaces because we know that yoga began in the Indus Valley civilization uh, yeah. over 2000 years ago, which is an area that now covers contemporary India. And yet I was just in a conversation with someone, a woman of color this weekend, in which she was describing the fact that she works at a yoga studio mm-hmm. and she was attempting to hire an Indian woman. And the owners of the studio were like, oh, no, well, no one will take their classes. And so she was finally able to argue to get this Indian woman hired um, only for that to be like born out. So this was a woman who was, you know, from India, grew up practicing yoga, but people were not taking their cla- her classes because in the American mindset, yoga is all about white women in contorted postures. Um, it's not about like all of the other things that the practice has traditionally been about, which is about Mm -hmm. spiritual liberation. Instead, it's like, this is a tool that I could use to look hotter, to improve my chances, usually with heterosexual men. And that is so problematic. And what it means is that you go into a yoga studio space and you are brown or black and people are immediately shocked. Like what is going on? You know, mm-hmm. they're like a bear just came in. Oh, you know, and so yeah. you experience all different kinds of microaggressions in there. So all of the different forms of anti-blackness, the fat phobia, um, all of the ways in which our societies outside of the yoga studio can be racist and exclusionary 
appear within the yoga space. And that's why I got involved with race and yoga, because we wanted to first simply show that this is going on. Mm -hmm. Um, There are many people who have no idea that this is happening. Mm -hmm. They don't see it. And so we need to recognize that there's a problem. And then we need to start thinking about how do we make these spaces more inclusive? You know, how do we rely on feminist principles? How do we rely on yoga principles to actually help yoga in America return to its original aims of liberation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's badass right there. That's that's (laughs) needed for sure because... Like you said, I, like people aren't aware of it. Yoga is such okay. a huge, huge industry and it's b- become commercialized. It's marketed. Even the clothing that you wear is marketed. It has a certain level of status to it. It has a certain level of whiteness to it. Um, and I think that has been very much ingrained within our culture um, in, a, in a way that is upholding white supremacy and fat phobia at the same time. Absolutely. I'm sure your listeners may remember when the CEO of Lululemon was like, um, yeah, we don't really make our clothes for fuller figured women. Right. And that right there tells you they expect it to be exclusionary as a form of status. Yeah. And that's just expensive. Right. I don't even know what those leggings cost now. Um, <laughs> the last time I looked, they were over a hundred dollars. And I was like, what is the sizing scheme in here? Uh, because yeah. this is not following anything that I know to be American sizing. And so it's, it's the whole situation is bizarre, but it's, yeah, it's money-making based on the idea that we only want slender women doing yoga, you know, very contorted postures in our clothes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, I mean, again, that like, that goes back to BMI as well, which again, racist. Um, everything is racist listeners. Right. There's this, there's this very sad (laughs) synergy across all of these sectors, right? They're they're, they're all invested in white supremacy in hidden ways. Yeah. And I hope that like people respond in a way, I mean, for, you know, someone asked what action steps can individuals and communities take? I think like, yes, it can feel very heavy. Yes, it can feel like, well, shit, this has been going on for centuries. This is ingrained in everything. I can't possibly do anything with this. Like, be curious about it to learn more, I think is yeah. like a first step because a lot of it you're probably blind to and has been your normal. And it's totally okay to like acknowledge and be like, oh yeah, shit, like I really do fuck with Lululemon and I love taking my yoga class and I didn't realize that, you know, parts of that in me that I wasn't really aware of were upholding white supremacy and racism. Like, that's okay. Say that shit to yourself. Say that shit to your friend and like maybe go to therapy and, you know, talk through that shit and like sort it out. Um, I think that's kind of maybe a, a step that individuals can start taking. Um, is there anything that that you would want to share specifically with listeners in terms of like, what steps both as individuals and maybe as communities that we can start taking to um, kind of fight back against fat phobia and its racist roots? Yes. Um, All of us need to be invested in single payer health care. If we can get universal health coverage in this country, that would go a long way to start to chip away at fat phobia. It will not reverse things overnight or magically. Mm -hmm. But consider the fact that one of the major claims that people who are fat phobic and within the medical field are making is that it's just so expensive, like obesity is so expensive. I want to point out that in a country like Canada, where so-called obesity rates are, right? And uh, look, yeah, I'm, tr- I'm trying. My boyfriend's Canadian. Okay. I'm okay. trying. Yeah, I'm telling you, we're all like, mm, can we make a little move? You know, um, but, but it's like in Canada, they have like a quote obesity, obesity rate of 30%, right? So not that divergent from what we have in the United States. Mm-hmm. However, when we talk about COVID specifically, their COVID fatality rates are far fewer Right. So we have 250 Americans have died from COVID. And the people are always like, well, it's because Americans are obese. Whereas in Canada, similar BMI, um, 10,000 deaths. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, making sure that everyone has the health care that they need is one important factor in that. Um, And so we can. Yeah, we can dramatically reduce costs and provide better coverage for all Americans with universal health care. The other thing we can do is we could fight back against the utilization of BMI. I'm starting to hear more medical professionals rethink this tool Hmm. for the first time 
you know, and so it's an exciting moment. We can, we, I think, have the momentum to start pushing for this change. Yeah. And the other thing that you can do is if you find that you are in spaces where people are fat phobic, speak up. You know, when you are silent, this allows this type of activity to be perpetuated. Um, I was in a yoga studio space maybe five years ago where a famous yoga instructor was going on and on about obesity And, you know, she was afraid of someone obese being at her training. And I had to be like, we don't know what a person's body is capable of by looking at them. Mm -hmm. You can't say, I mean, anyone who's seen someone like Jessamine Stanley, for example, and there are countless others um, who are on Instagram, you can see that the human body is incredible and it is not limited by size. So Mm -hmm. just pushing back against these kinds of obvious and open fat phobic comments also helps to create a greater space for people who identify as that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Y'all heard it, write it down, send it to a friend, get, get, get going. Those are, those are some amazing action (laughs) steps and um, yeah, voting for people who uh, support universal healthcare and questioning your doctors on BMI. And I'm curious too, yeah, like do medical professionals even learn like the actual history of how the BMI was created or are they just like, this is the BMI, this is what it is? I think it's the latter. I think they just got this tool. Everybody's already been using it. And so they just keep using yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. That is just like the standard. Mm-mm. Exactly. It's troubling. Next time you go to a doctor, you can be like, um, actually, did you read Fearing the Black Body, uh, The Race Origins of Fat Phobia? <laughs> because there's a section on the BMI, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but if you're telling me I'm overweight, um, I actually think I disagree. Exactly. Yeah. So just pushing back against this sort of like taking for granted knowledge about the way in which we have to reform our bodies. Our bodies are fine the way that they are. Yeah. Absolutely. I love it. I love you. I love this book. This is all amazing stuff. Favorite episode ever. Um, (laughs) Can you share a little bit about how people can find you, how people can support you, um, how they can get to all of your fantastic work, where they can find the book, all the things? Uh, Yes. So you can follow me on Twitter at S.A. Strings. I'm tweeting like once every two weeks, so definitely not overwhelming for you to keep up with what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Um, I also have my website, which is just my full name, sabrinastrings.com. And you can also follow us on Race and Yoga at Instagram and Twitter. We have a new issue of Race and Yoga coming out today, as it mm-hmm. were, and it's focused on South Asian voices. So very excited to be putting that out. Yeah. Amazing. We'll put the link to that um, in the episode notes as well for people to check out. Um, Thank you so freaking much for doing all the work that you've done um, for like this book is just so amazing. So amazing. Thank you so much, Taylor. Um, This has been wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. 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 All right, that does it for today's episode. Thank you so much for making it all the way through and keeping your ears, your hearts, and your minds open. It would mean so much to me if you could take a second or two after listening to this episode to leave a review on iTunes and let me know what you're enjoying about the show. I love reading you know, what your favorite episodes are, where you guys listen, um, and definitely feel free to share this with a friend. I mean, part of how we break down the stigmas around these topics is by talking about them, right, and, and sharing them with more people. So definitely share the podcast. Um, and again, really wanting to include all of you in this podcast. So if you have questions or you want to share a thought or an experience, please send in a voice memo to ask.letstalkaboutit at gmail.com. And I'm really excited to keep having these conversations and uh, breaking down these stigmas. So thank you all so, so, so much. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week and I'll talk to you next time. If you want to be the most interesting person at the cocktail party, well, hop on over and listen to the Brain Candy Podcast. Our award-winning content will have you laughing whilst you're learning. We read all the best articles, books, and studies and keep up with new TV shows, documentaries, and pop culture. Then cram it all into two shows a week. Conspiracy theories, cannibal rabbits, unsolved mysteries, the history of the Walkman. There's something for everyone. The Brain Candy Podcast. Find our link in the show notes. Or simply search for the Brain Candy Podcast on your podcast app.